um, for those of you who have been living under a rock uh, and haven't seen 60 Minutes and Frontline and heard him on NPR and the Today Show and practically every other uh, and haven't seen the front page stories in the New York Times, Ali Sufan is the author of the uh, of this great book, The Black Banners, which is really a history of Al Qaeda from 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 the dawn of Al Qaeda to now, in a sense, and also American counterterrorism efforts. Uh, also, the he is the president and CEO of uh, the uh, Sufan Group, which does business in the Middle East, um, and um, spent was one of the principal investigators of the coal uh, attack and also the U.S. Embassy attacks and, of course, 9/11. Um, and so, what we agreed to do is that uh, Mr. Sufan would speak for about 15 minutes and lay out some of the general themes of the book, and then I would interview him uh, without using coercive in techniques. Um, <laughs> Uh, for a, a little bit and then throw it open to your questions. And I will prove for you that they won't work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for uh, the introduction. Very happy to be here with you. Um, as much as I hate uh, leaving New York, but I'm very honored and pleased to be here in DC today. Um, the reason I wrote the book is mainly because I found out that there's a lot of wrong narratives. Wrong narratives about Al Qaeda, wrong narratives about our successes against the group, wrong narratives about our failures against the group. Let's stand up to see people over there. So. Um, so I decided to just write the facts, the facts of what happened in our war against Al Qaeda that started way early on than before 9-11. One of the things that uh, annoy many of us who many, many of you guys are here, I used to work with in the field, um, and it's great to see you. One of the things that annoy us uh, when we hear that we did not know what hit us on 9-11. We were really shocked. Who are these people at Al-Qaeda? Well, think about it this way. Osama bin Laden was indicted in the Southern District of New York because of the hard work of the people in the intelligence community and in the FBI and the different law enforcement entities that's part of the uh, task force in New York, was indicted in June of 1998. That's a few months before the very first covert act that Al-Qaeda did in attacking the twin embassies in Nairobi and in Dar es Salaam. We already had him under a sealed indictment. So we knew exactly who attacked us on 9-11. We were working very hard during the USS Cole investigation and we get a lot of information and a lot of intelligence that if that information and intelligence were responded to by people in Washington and the other half of this information that some other entities in Washington had was shared with us, 9-11 could have been stopped. So it's not the genius of Al-Qaeda that carried out 9-11, it's the incompetency of the United States agencies and it's the institutional bickering that we have in Washington that caused 9-11. And this is not only me saying that, this is not my side of the story. The 9-11 Commission, one of their first findings, they concluded that if the central intelligence agencies passed information about a meeting that took place in Southeast Asia that we got information about from the USS Cole attack, if that information was shared to the FBI team investigating the USS Cole, specifically the FBI team investigating the USS Cole, 9-11 could have been stopped at early stages. And that's not only the 9-11 Commission who came up with that conclusion. The CIA's own Inspector General came with a sem very similar con conclusion. The CIA IG said the CIA did not pass the information on timely basis about Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khaled Mehdar being here in the United States to the FBI, to the State Department, to the Immigration and Naturalization Services, nor they even uh, uh, list them on a no-fly list. So everyone agreed about these conclusions that I'm, I'm, I'm making here, or, or these, you know, if somebody want to call them allegations that I'm making here. Also at the same time, we look at all the successes that we did. And every time there's any kind of success or any kind of failure, we start pointing fingers in Washington. This is FBI versus CIA, or this is CIA versus FBI. In my book, you will see how CIA officers, I'm an FBI agent, CIA officers are the heroes of the book. In every chapter, it was CIA people who did the right thing. From enhanced interrogation techniques, that program, ladies and gentlemen, was not stopped. That program was not stopped because of a new administration in Washington. 
That program was shelved in 2005 because so many CIA people went to their inspector general and complained about the enhanced interrogation techniques. And after an, a review of the program, they came up to the conclusion that they could not prove, the inspector general of the CIA could not prove that one single imminent plot was stopped because of waterboarding and enhanced interrogation techniques. And then towards the end, the inspector general also spoke about the efficacy of this program and the strategic impact, the long-term impact and the short impact, short-term impact that such a program will do not only on the CIA but also on the United States government. That's why the program was shelved in 2005. 2005, not a lot of people talk about that. When you see all the successes that we did in East Africa, all the successes that we did in Yemen, all the successes that we did in Albania, in Italy, in the United Kingdom with Operation Challenge and other operations that we did with our colleagues in the UK, the successes in Southeast Asia, this is a success, you know, all these successes are when people in the field from the CIA, from the FBI, from the different intelligence agencies, from NCIS, who were extremely important, played extremely important role in the war on terror, especially after the USS call. We were working very closely together. I say in my book that when enhanced interrogation techniques was forced down the throat of the agency by outside contractors, before I left the Abu Zubaydah location, the undisclosed location where Abu Zubaydah was interrogated, before I left as an FBI agent, a CIA person left before me in a protest. So it's not the CIA versus the FBI. It is the CIA and the FBI versus people in Washington. It's operational people in the field, working in the field, versus people who thought they know better here in DC. So there's a lot of successes that has been accomplished before and after. But also we have to acknowledge that we have some failures. 400 Qaeda guys, 400. That is the total number of Al Qaeda at the eve of 9-11. 400 people lasted in a war longer than World War I and World War II and the Vietnam War. So you want to tell me we didn't do any mistakes? Why? Because instead of looking for bin Laden in Pakistan and in Afghanistan, we're looking for WMDs that don't exist in Iraq. And now in the last two years, I'm glad to say that we have 21 members of Al-Qaeda, high level members of Al-Qaeda has been killed and ca and, and, or captured. And this is due to the efforts of the intelligence community and especially the men and women of the CIA. Because now people are focusing on how to do the job. Not putting all our eggs in waterboarding. And there's still until today people claim that the whole Western civilization was waterboarded, was, 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 was saved because we water, waterboarded three people. That's it. We only waterboarded three people. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Abu Zubaydah, and Abdul Rahim al Nashiri, the mastermind of the USS Cole. Three people. We solved all the problems of the world. We disrupted every terrorist plot in the world because of waterboarding three people. So what I talk about in the book, I talk about the facts. I talk about, about the facts as a person who witnessed them. I tried not to make any judgment. I wanted the reader to make the judgment, not me. This is a book about a very important period of our history, a very important era of the 21st, civil, uh, 21st century. Actually, it's the very first war of the 21st century. And if you look at it, there's a lot of politics concerning this era. But I wanted to kind of like pull away from the politics and just tell the reader and tell the American people what happened. What happened in 1979 that caused eventually Al-Qaeda to become the organization that became? What happened when bin Laden was in Sudan after the first Gulf War? How did he structure the organization? How did they build 
the uh, East Africa network? How did they build the European network? How after Sudan kicked him out of Khartoum and he went back to Afghanistan, how he established a new different organization of Al-Qaeda? Totally different with more and more people who came from the Arabian Peninsula, from Yemen, from Saudi Arabia, how they start establishing that network in Yemen and in Saudi Arabia for Al-Qaeda. How they conducted the East Africa embassy bombing. What we knew after the East Africa bombing was, con uh, after the attack took place. What is the result of the investigation of the work, the great work of the CIA and the FBI and DOD and all the different elements and entities that's working together? What's all the disruptions that we did in between the East Africa embassy bombing and the USS Cole? The Millennium Operation, for example, in Jordan. The different threats that took place around the world. How important was these kind of disruptions that took place? Like, for example, in Operation Challenge in the UK. Operation Challenge was uh, an operation that we did with the SO13, which is the anti-terrorism branch at the time in Scotland Yard. And it targeted an individual named Khalid Fawaz and uh, some of, of his, uh, of his uh, uh, you know, colleagues. And Khalid Fawaz was a person who actually established the network in Nairobi that conducted the East Africa embassy bombings. He's the very first guy who established that network. And then he tried to establish a similar network in Europe. And he was assisted to do that by some Egyptian Islamic Jihad members from their office they send, actually from across the street from their office, they send the claims of responsibility for Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. When we did the operation in London, we had a treasure trove of information that we got about the whole Qaeda network in Europe, actually in the world, and how it's linked to Afghanistan and to Pakistan. And this is not because of statements of any individual, it's because of their whole archive system was in 1A Beethoven in London. That's the address of their office. Then the USS call and all the stuff that we knew from the USS call to include a statement from Fahd al Kuso, one of the uh, uh, coordinator of the attack, and he was supposed to videotape the operation when it took place. And the information that Fahd al Kuso gave us could have stopped 9-11. And then after 9-11, all the successes that we had, we had a lot of successes. But we also had some things that's going to, you know, it, it, it's, I think the only way I'm going to say it, it's going to damage our reputation for a while around the world. Because if it damaged our reputation in the United States among our people, it is going to damage our reputation around the world. And for what? These enhanced interrogation techniques, the so-called enhanced interrogation techniques, these 12 steps, as appalling as they are to people like you and me, they are nothing, they are nothing compared to what these guys are expecting when they go to a jail in Egypt or to jails in the Middle East. There is nothing. Waterboarding, waterboarding is like a drinking tea in an Egyptian jail. <laughs> you know, the treatment didn't even start. So why do you want to take a detainee to a route where you're already proving to him that everything he believes about you is true because of the way you're treating him, and when you do half torture, because in a democracy we have a red line, that red line here, the glass ceiling, is waterboarding, so we cannot do anything after waterboarding. So what do we do? We keep doing it again and again and again. And in case of Abu Zubaydah, we did it 83 times. In case of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, 183 times. When do you realize that this is not working? I mean, no wonder he didn't say anything. He doesn't have time to breathe. When do we realize that this is not working? So why do you give that detainee a sense of control of his destiny? Because that's exactly what he's expecting. And instead, of outsmarting them. And believe me, those guys are even the smartest people in the organization. From my experience, they are not that smart. Because if they are, think about it, they won't do, be doing what they were doing. Logic, 
linear thinking, critical thinking, is not part of their vocabulary, which makes it easy to break. And I talk about so many interrogations in the book. And these interrogations I can talk about now because they have been declassified by the US government or because I testified about them in court. Bin Laden's personal secretary, a person that we have no idea who he was. He was considered in Guantanamo as part of the good guys. That he's not Qaeda, we arrested him by mistake and brought him to Getma. After an hour talking to him, he looks at me and he said, well, you know what? I am Anas al Makki, I'm Bin Laden's secretary, what do you want? And I said to him, do you want to have some tea? And he was having a cookie and he already, you know, almost spit it out. He said, I just told you who I am and you're telling me if I want to drink tea? He said, well, I already knew who you are, but now I'm respecting you, so I'm giving you some tea. And guess what? We did the interrogation right. We get the intelligence that we wanted. We prosecuted the guy in Guantanamo and he will never see the light of the day again. KSM has been in custody for how long? And today, we heard that there will be not even a trial this year. It's for next year. The end game. We're a democracy. We're the best country on earth, even with everything that happened. And let me tell you something. <laughs> We're not going to take any of these guys, put a bullet in their heads, and bury them under a tree. What are you going to do with them towards the end? So when I opposed in his interrogation techniques, I did not oppose it from a moral perspective. And I had the courage to somebody tell me, ask me, will you torture some guy if he will get the information to save life? It will be a very, very difficult situation. But guess what? I think deeply in my heart, yes, I will. Because there's a big difference between compliance and between cooperation. Cooperation, you see it in the Abu Jandal 302 that was released and declassified by the Senate, Bin Laden's personal bodyguard. Hundreds of pages that talks about everything that you want to know about Al-Qaeda. And we talk about how we get the interrogation and how we did the interrogation, myself and my partner, uh, Special Agent Bob McFadden from NCIS, and how we get the intelligence that's needed. Bin Laden's personal driver, Hamdan, Bin Laden's personal secretary. And we go one after another after another. Awali, Stephen Godin, who was one of the FBI agents in New York who interrogated him and get the information that we needed from him regarding the link between the East Africa Embassy bombing and between the, uh, b between the Bin Laden network. So we talk about how we get a lot of the intelligence and the get a lot of the information. This is accurate, actionable intelligence. The most important thing when you want intelligence is to get accurate intelligence. Not false intelligence that's going to take you like chasing your tail around the world. Compliance is different. Compliance is what I am telling you when you're interrogating me because I know that's what you want to hear. I want you to stop the bad treatment so I tell you whatever you want to hear. And I gave an example that has been declassified by the Armed Services Committee, the example of Ibn Shaykh al-Libi. Ibn Shaykh al-Libi was tortured in a third country. It's not in his interrogation techniques. It's way beyond that. It's torture. He went to a, another country that did the job. Ibn Shaykh al-Libi admitted that Saddam and bin Laden are working together on developing a WMD. People in Washington were high-fiving each other. The analysts in the CIA refused to give the information. The analysts in the FBI refused to give the information. And now we got the information. See, all of you guys are wrong. We got what we want. Colin Powell went to the UN. I think all of you guys remember the, the Security Council. He spoke about the information that Ibn Sheikh al-Libi gave us regarding WMD. And he mentioned him by name, Ibn Sheikh al-Libi. Gave the information. After we went to Iraq, we found out two things. First, Saddam and Al-Qaeda Saddam and Al-Qaeda are not working together. Second, there's no WMDs. So they went back to him and they said, why did you lie? To paraphrase what he said, he said, well, you were torturing me. I gave you what you wanted to hear. Compliance. Tragic. Loss of blood. Treasure. Foreign policy influence. 
you name it. That's compliance. So yes, you can get the information that you want, but is it accurate information? And then to finish, we were told, all of us, about what's the information that we got from enhanced interrogation techniques that saved lives. We were told it's because of waterboarding. We knew that Jose Padilla, the alleged dirty bomber, was going to detonate a dirty bomb in the New York area. We knew that because of that, KSM was identified as a mastermind of 9-11. Or we knew about the plot to blow up apartment buildings in the United States, or about the plot to blow up the Brooklyn Bridge, and so forth. With all due respect to people who told us this, I was there. We did not get that information because of EITs. We did not get the information because of waterboarding. Waterboarding did not start until the summer of 2002. Okay? Jose Padilla was in custody after an international manhunt in three different countries okay? in May of 2002. But unless you have a time machine, you're going to have a problem with the timeline. KSM, we knew about him as a mastermind of 9-11 in April of 2002. Waterboarding did not start until the end of July 2002. Verbally, July 25th. The written order, August 1st. So, how can you justify that? And these things are not, these things are now the, the result of a lot of government programs and government, sorry, government declassified documents from the DOJ to the Office of Professional Responsibility. Actually, the Office of Professional Responsi Responsibility declassified their report uh, last year, and it was amazing. Mr. Bradbury, who was trying to reinstate the 2000 and 2005 the Enhanced Interrogation Program after the CIA IG you know, held shelving that program, mentioned that timeline that I just mentioned to you in his memo. So the investigators in DOJ ask, well, wait a second. Padilla was arrested in May of 2002. Waterboarding did not happen until August of 2002. So how can you, how can you say it's because of that? He said, no, you know, in the efficacy memo, they said that waterboarding, uh, they said that Padilla was arrested in May of 2003, not May 2002. So they went back and they found that he was arrested in May 2002. He said, why didn't you check the fact that they gave you a wrong date? He said, my job is not to check facts. <laughs> I'm not making that up. Google it. OPR report. So this is why... I felt obligated that we need to put the truth out. And the truth is not a truth about who's right and who's wrong. It's not a truth about FBI. It's not the truth about CIA. It's not the truth about DOJ or DOD. You will see in the book that each one of these entities that I mentioned, they have heroes in the book. It's about people in the field who knew better. And who were told not to follow up on what they know because Washington knows better. And that's why, ladies and gentlemen, 400 Qaeda guys on the eve of 9-11 lasted in a war longer than any other war that we fought. And it goes back to the golden rule of warfare. Sun Tzu said a long time ago, if you know your enemy and know yourself, you will win a hundred times in a hundred battles. Unfortunately, we forget about who we are, and we definitely did not take time to learn about the enemy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali. That was a brilliant summation of the themes of the book. Why did you call it the Black Banners? This, again, to show how little we know about the enemy. There's a alleged saying for the prophet, Hadith, that said towards the end of time, black banners will come to, from Khurasan. Khurasan is a historic area in Central Asia. And they will be victorious. They won't stop until they erect their flag uh, near Beit al-Maqdis, Jerusalem. So if you see them, it's your religious duty to follow them. That Hadith 
uh, was quoted to me many times by Qaeda members. And they truly believe that this is the end of times. And they truly believe that it is their role to fight for the sake of the Prophet because that's an order given to them by the Prophet. I wanted people to know about the cult that Al-Qaeda created. There is a cult, there is a counterculture. Counterculture even within Islam, even within Sunni radical Islam. And that's something we don't know about. And that's something we're not very familiar with. Um, but this is important. This is who they are. This is what they believe in. This is the ideology that sustained them as a group. Um, even they changed, you know, in Sudan, um, people thought it's probably the end of Al-Qaeda. They went to Afghanistan and they changed in Afghanistan and they became a different entity. Uh, the same thing in, uh, after 9-11. We thought it was the end of Al-Qaeda after Tora Bora and after all the arrests that took place in Pakistan and Faisalabad and, 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 and many different areas around, around Pakistan. However, they were able to switch from being chief motivator, uh, ch chief operator to being chief motivators and they created different Al-Qaeda's. So now we have Al-Qaeda Central Command that's headed by Zawahiri and it's interesting that the term Central Command now is being used by Al-Qaeda statements. And then you have Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. You have Al-Qaeda in uh, the Islamic Maghrib. You have Al-Qaeda in Iraq. But each one of these Qaeda's are totally different. They recruit differently. They get their money uh, for different reasons. They're funding for different reasons. In uh, Islamic Maghrib, we start seeing alliance between some radical Islamists from Algeria with some groups, tribal groups, in the border area between Mali, Mauritania, and Niger. Now they are expanding and they start to have some uh, you know, operational relationship with Boko Haram in, in Nigeria. In Iraq, totally different. They don't care about many of these local issues that Islamic Maghrib cares about. They care about the problem between Sunnis and Shiites and trying to create more factions between them and more war between Sunnis and Shiites because that's how they get their money and their funding from people in the Gulf who really thinks that fighting the Shia in Iran is in I Iraq will stop Iranian influence in Iraq. Uh, you look at uh, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, uh, it's, it's two different factions now. It's the Saudi factions and it's the Yemeni factions. And their operation is totally different than the operation in the other two areas. Now we see them trying to be part of the fabric uh, political opposition in the south and taking advantage of that insurgency very similar way to what they did in the Sunni Triangle in Iraq at the very beginning. So now there is legitimate concerns in southern Yemen. There are people who believe that uh, their rights, their lands has been confiscated by the south and by the Saleh regime and those individuals have a lot of problem with the north. Um, unfortunately now Al-Qaeda came in the middle of this and uh, they start to give the support and the funding for a lot of these entities. And the only reason I think that we can separate them from is to force the Saleh regime to negotiate with the opposition down south, exactly like General Petraeus did in Iraq in negotiating in the Sunni triangle with the Sunni tribes. This is the only way when Al-Qaeda showed their own skins and start killing other Sunnis because they are negotiating. Uh, I think every Qaeda has different regional, socio-economic, political incubator that makes it function in that region. So it's very different. But there is one thing in common between all of them, this kind of ideology. The ideology that they are doing something because it's the end of time, they are doing something because this is their religious duty to do it, and this is what the Prophet wanted them to do. So how would you assess the claim that this ha doesn't have much to do with Islam or religion? It doesn't because actually that hadith is a very questionable hadith. Mm -hmm. And even uh, Salman al-Auda, who was a, sco a Saudi scholar who supported Al-Qaeda at the beginning, and he ended up in Saudi jail after the first Gulf War. Bin Laden uh, mentioned him in his declaration of jihad in 1996, and he also mentioned him in the claims of responsibility for the East Africa embassy bombing, both bombings uh, in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. Um, he said that this is a questionable hadith and this is not an accurate hadith. This is a counterculture that they created for themselves. And interestingly enough, Peter, that hadith is also uh, mentioned by Shia. And they believe that the black banner will come from Kufa, from Iraq. <laughs> and some of them believe <laughs> it comes from Iran and Khorasan is more Iran than Afghanistan. So both Sunnis and Shias use their hadith and a lot of the radical Hezbollah or radical revolutionary guard people, if you actually talk to them, 
um, they basically believe that uh, Khamenei is uh, the leader of the Black Banners. How would, you know, you, you run a, um, a company, which obviously you're a very busy man uh, with uh, your, your business. How did you go about your writing process? And um, Daniel Friedman is, is here and he's right. your kind of co-author. How did that, mm -hmm. how did you work this? Uh, well, it was at the beginning I had to put down the information and Dan played with the information and made it uh, basically readable. Because if you trust me with the information, I'll probably confuse the reader more than I confused most of the people today when I'm talking. <laughs> so Dan, Dan was extremely helpful in, uh, in putting this together. And what was your writing process? You wrote in the morning before going to work, or how did you? It was every time I have uh, free time. Sometimes right. in the morning, sometimes at night, sometimes on the plane. You know, it depends. You mentioned the book has heroes, uh, but also has some villains. But let's talk about the heroes. Mm -hmm. uh, Oni John O'Neill is clearly a hero in the book. Yep. He was sort of a mentor. Uh, to John you. John O'Neill was an interesting guy. He was a legend in the FBI, especially when it ca it comes to national security. He was a special agent in charge in the New York office for national security at the time. Uh, terrorism and foreign counterintelligence with all the different branches came under one umbrella, the umbrella of national security, and John was in charge of that. John, one, one of these people who basically knew about the threat and knew that it's only about time for something as big as 9-11 to take uh, taking place. Unfortunately, for many reasons, uh, he became very uh, disappointed with the FBI, and he retired about a week before 9-11, uh, only to take a job at the head of security as a World Trade Center. Uh, unfortunately, on 9-11, um, the threat that John was always warning about happened, and John was a victim of it. He died in the World Trade Center. But he's, uh, he's a guy that um, um, I learned a lot from. Um, I consider him as a mentor. Uh, our relationship became stronger and stronger during the USS call because he was on the ground most of the time. And, um, and uh, I, I learned the importance of focusing on the details and not uh, drinking the Kool-Aid and jumping on the bandwagon. How unusual was it to be an Arab speaker at the FBI before 9-11? And how many Arabic speakers do you think are at the FBI now? And do you know uh, George Pirro, who of course did Saddam Hussein's interrogation? Right, no, I, I don't know jo uh, uh, George well, uh, but I met him a couple of times. Um, I think we have, uh, uh, honestly, I truly believe that we are probably at the, same, at, the same, uh, at the same level. Now, the Bureau will tell you we have a lot of people who speak Arabic, but they speak Arabic after learning Arabic as a second language. As you know, with Arabic, uh, you need to, if you want to speak it as a, uh, as, as, as a second language, you have to be, uh, you have to live overseas uh, because there's, it's a language that have a lot of induendos. The culture affects the language so much. Without understanding both, it's very difficult to carry on. Uh, you know, uh, you know, an interrogation, for example, in, in 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 Arabic. So I, I think the numbers are probably in the same field, um, and I think we need to do more in recruiting uh, uh, native speakers. Where were you when Bin Laden died? I was home. I was uh, putting together a very complicated. Um, uh, uh, baby chair. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. And, uh, thanks. <laughs> it was very complicated. All these maps that they give you, they don't work. And, uh, and then I had a, the greatest excuse not to finish it because uh, <laughs> the president was talking about Bin Laden's death, and that was my excuse to my wife. <laughs> Were you um, surprised about how he died without putting up a resistance, so where he died in Abdabad? How long it took to find I, him? I was surprised that we found him in, uh, you know, I, I knew most of probably he will be in Pakistan, but I was, I was surprised that it was um, a town that hosted the Pakistanis West Point. Yeah. And uh, literally, uh, like a few yards from the gate, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, it's very difficult for me to believe that in a town like this, knowing Pakistan, and you know Pakistan, they don't know who lives in each one of the houses, especially with all the terrorism and stuff like that that's taken place. It's, it's, it's very difficult that uh, the Pakistanis, and, or some elements, not everyone in Pakistan, some elements in Pakistan uh, did not know uh, about him being there. Did, when you interrogated members of Al-Qaeda after 9-11, uh, did they ever give you a kind of really 
unvarnished assessment of bin Laden, or was he, I mean, in the sense that, you know, um, he didn't really have much of a plan in Tora Bora. He didn't, you know, he... Yes, um, it's extremely interesting <laughs> um, how Al-Qaeda members view these things. Mm. Uh, bin Laden cannot do wrong in mm. their mind. I mean, when we talk about sports, He's the best sportsman in the world. When we talk about soccer, everyone wants Bin Laden to be on their team because the Sheikh knows how to score goals. When you talk, he he is the best in everything. I mean, this guy have a god image to to these people, and I mean, um, those are the the muscles, the operational people. Um, I think when you go to individuals like Abu Zubaydah and higher up, they are more critical. Uh, but still, they are very hesitant to say bad things about, about the person that they gave bayah to. Bayah means he owns your life. He tells you, die, you will die. He tells you, live, you will live. So you have to have a lot of uh, trust or a lot of uh, um, idealism to an individual to give them a bayah. Bayah means oath in Arabic, right? But oath of allegiance, yeah. Have you seen the film The Oath? about Salim Hamdan and no, no, Abu Jandal? No, not yet. I, usually, I think you find it interesting. Um, are you concerned, I mean, there are about a hundred Yemeni detainees in Guantanamo. Do you think they'll right. be there for? Yes. I mean, for? I, don't, I think this is one of the biggest problems in closing Guantanamo. It's what to do with the Yemeni detainees. Do you have any ideas? Do you have any sense of how long this might take? I think the, the situation is going to be very difficult, uh, especially with what's happening today in Yemen. Um, we, uh, we investigated the call. We arrested all the people who were involved in the call. And um, you know, I'm being a little bit sarcastic, but somebody forgot to lock the jail. So they escaped. Twice. Twice. And uh, then they only came back after they negotiated with Saleh that they will surrender if he give them clemency and they don't go to jail. And this is, for example, Badawi, who had a capital punishment on him by a Yemeni judge. We helped the Yemenis prosecute them. Then we did another operation. We arrested them again. And uh, we did it jointly with NCIS and the military. Uh, it's a fusion cell that uh, existed in Yemen at the time. They were planning to uh, do some hits on the American embassy the French embassy, the British embassy, <laughs> and Italian embassy, and you're going to love this one, the Cuban embassy. They want to blow up the Cuban embassy because of a Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I wish we didn't miss that, you know, just <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean that. <laughs> so uh, we, um, we arrested them. We put them, we prosecuted them, actually. The Yemeni said, no, they have to be prosecuted there. So we went, we, prosec we worked with the Yemeni prosecution team. Um, it was, you know, uh, reported on the media and everything that we were there. Put them in jail. And then they dug a tunnel, supposedly. And they escaped. And the people who escaped were the people that you hear about today as the leaders of Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. Nasser al haishi for example, who was known as Abu Basir al-Yamani, one of bin Laden's uh, close assistants. Uh, Abdullah al-Rimi, uh, Qasim al-Rimi, sorry. Qasim al-Rimi was a, a little player then. He wasn't that important when we arrested him, Abu Huraira Sanani. And uh, the people that you see now, uh, Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, are people who escaped. Plus the number two guy, the big bomb maker who was involved in every bomb making plot from the cargo to the dirty bomber to the, assassina the assassination attempt on Mohammed bin Nayef, he was in Guantanamo. And uh, we sent him back to the Saudis, and he escaped from Saudi Arabia, went to Yemen, and he uh, joined uh, Al-Qaeda in Yemen, uh, creating him and Abu Basir, uh, meaning Nasser al uh, what we know today as Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. You so what do you want to do? You, know, you send them to Yemen, you're going to have more people to worry about <laughs> over there. You mentioned uh, Nashiri, the leader of the coal operation. Yes. Uh, he's going to go on trial in Guantanamo. Yes. Uh, it's going to be a military commission. Right. And he will probably face the death penalty almost certainly, right? Right. Will you be uh, testifying in the trial? Yeah, absolutely. Are you concerned about military commissions as a venue no. for justice? Why, why I, not? I, I, I actually, look, you know, it's something interesting with a military commission. The U.S. government cannot force you, if you're not part of the government, to go down and testify because they don't have authority over you as citizens. Hmm. But I went down and testified uh, against Hamdan. I testified against Bahlul. You know, you know, uh, almost uh, two other trials 
uh, I met with both the defense and the prosecution um, because I get the confessions from the guys and thankfully the two guys pled guilty so we don't have to worry about you know going down and having a trial so I've been involved from the beginning with the military commission and I truly believe that you know we are at war and we have a lot of tools in our toolbox and we need to use whatever we have in the toolbox to win that war I don't believe it's either or I don't believe it's I believe in the federal system I believe in uh, title three courts I believe they are extremely effective but also I believe that sometimes um, we don't have the th we don't meet the threshold that's required in a title three court but however we know that the person like Nashiri for example is an evil guy so why don't we use the military commission and I worked in the military I worked I you know didn't work for them I testified <laughs> during military commission so I had the pleasure and the honor to work both with the prosecution and with the defense and let me tell you the military commissions those people have more rights than maybe most of the countries around the world with with the prosecutions so it's not a kangaroo court I, I, I hate when I hear the term uh, I think the military prosecutors and the defense are doing their job to prosecute these people and uh, to guarantee that justice is being served and uh, I think somebody like Hamdan for example I, I believe sometimes that the threshold the, sorry I believe sometimes um, the the the, um, the federal court are more effective because somebody like Hamdan if he found guilty on the same charges in a federal court yeah. he will be in jail for at least 12 years in Guantanamo they didn't they did not have at the time sentencing guidelines so he got like four years time served or something like this and they sent him back to Yemen so I believe that the military commissions have its role but also the federal system have its role and there's not there's no system better than the other it depends on the detainee and it depends on the terrorist are you concerned about um I mean, the way that we're dealing with high-level members of Al-Qaeda now is we're essentially killing them with drone strikes. Um, there are some advantages, perhaps, in the sense that you don't ha have to, I mean, there might be some advantages in the sense that you don't have to detain them in the legal morass of Guantanamo. Right. Obviously, there's some disadvantages and you can't interrogate them. There's no pocket litter. There's no computers. There's no cell phones. How do you come down on that issue? I mean, we well, just I think two, two different things. I think the people who are we killing in, the, in drones are people who are far away in areas like in the, in, in, in the Fatah region or in uh, North Waziristan or in, uh, in Yemen in a place that it's going to be extremely difficult to send the troops and special forces and SEAL team just to arrest the individual. So it, it's going to cause a lot of problems. So I think it is better if you know they are sitting there, they are conspiring, they want to carry an attack, I say, you know, sorry, I'm not trying to be insensitive, but whack them. You know, kill them before they kill us. That's how I look at it. Now, I disagree that we're killing everyone. We have been arresting a lot of people. Just recently, for example, before 9-11, we arrested El Moritani. Right. And so if an individual, uh, if, if, if there's an individual that we can arrest, no, we're grabbing, we're not killing. But if there's people who are really far away, we use the drone. This is the very first question. The second part of the question is, I don't think the drone will change the strategy of the war. I think the drone missiles um, give us tactical wins. But these tactical wins won't change the strategy because of the nature of Al-Qaeda, because we're not you know, combating the narrative, we're not combating the ideology, we're not dealing with the local and regional incubators that's creating this, this problem. And, um, uh, but I think, uh, I think it gives us a lot of tactical wins in the process. One final question. Um, you mentioned NCIS, which stands for? Naval Criminal Investigative Services. And your closest partner uh, was Bob McFadden, who worked. Yep. Is that an unusual kind of uh, where the FBI and the Naval Criminal Investigation Service? No, actually, it's interesting. My very first partner when I joined in uh, the FBI at the Terrorism Task Force was a CIA officer. Um, and then I had uh, an FBI partner, and then with the USS Cole, um, we had an NCIS agent assigned to the JTTF in New York. Uh, the time of the call, I think, JTTF in New York had probably about... Um, 35 different agencies um, and we always worked very closely together um, then 
after the call uh, attack in October 12 of 2000, Bob was assigned as a case agent from NCIS. And we usually work great with other agencies. So John O'Neill came and told me that he's going to be uh, a person from NCIS I have to work with. And uh, we bonded, and we're still best friends until today. Actually, he just uh, retired a few months ago, and uh, we work together now. Great. I'm going to throw it open to questions if you could identify yourself uh, before you, and wait for the microphone. And questions are encouraged, not statements. So, yeah. uh, who has, where's Jen, if you come to the front here? Yeah. Alexis Hobjanko, I'm representing myself here. Uh, question is, my question is the following. Many people claim that Al-Qaeda al is basically over, that it will never be able to mount an operation, such a sophisticated operation like 9-11. Some people say that Arabic Spring might breathe new life into something Al-Qaeda-like-ish. What is your forecast? What is your prognosis? How long this war is going to last? Is that another 10 years? It's another generation? What is, what is this war? The, and one more thing, uh, in what you said, Remind me very much about the docudrama Part 9-11, which is practically banned for any practical pur purpose at the NAS. What do you think of this docudrama, Path to 9-11? It was shown on ABC in September 2006, five-year anniversary. Um, to start with the last portion of the question, I seriously didn't see the drama. I, I didn't watch it. I, I don't watch a lot of things about 9-11 uh, and stuff like that, personally. Um, I, uh, um, the first question, I think, Al-Qaeda that attacked us on 9-11 doesn't exist anymore. You know, there's still members from that organization that exist. But I think Al-Qaeda, I think, you know, Peter, you talked about Qaeda 2.0. I think now we're Al-Qaeda 3.0. It's a different organization. However, we should not take it as a paper tiger in any way, shape, or form. I think Zawahiri is uh, an organized person. I think Zawahiri will be happy. Uh, to carry out an attack if he can and he needs to carry out an attack in order to give legitimacy for his leadership among the other factions in Al-Qaeda. So we have to keep our eyes on the ball. We cannot just let it go. Um, now I think it's way difficult for them at this point to carry an attack for many reasons. Um, as for the uh, as, as, as for the portion about the Arab Spring, I think the Arab Spring definitely dealt another blow to Al-Qaeda, like the death of bin Laden. Because now the ideology that we have to focus on the far enemy rather than the close enemy, which is a big difference between the jihadi Qaeda type and the Jathakfiri type, uh, does not exist anymore. Because now people believe that if you uh, focus in changing your own destiny with your own hands, without using terrorism, without using uh, you know, uh, uh, bad, evil ways. The, peop the, the, the United States and the whole world and NATO and everybody will be with you. And Libya is, is an example of that. Egypt is an example of that. Tunisia is an example of that. Um, so, however, this might create down the road a problem. And we have to keep our eyes open to see what's going on in Libya, for example, and who is going to be, you know, in charge of, uh, in Libya because there are elements uh, who are radical Islamists, not necessarily Qaeda, but they are radical Islamists. People, as a few years ago, they were on the terrorist watch lists. Uh, you know, the Libyan fighting group, for example, the leader of the Libyan fighting group, Abdullah al-Sadiq, uh, is actually Balhaj, uh, the leader of Tripoli today. Uh, he's a person that was arrested before. He's a person that uh, uh, was invited to our uh, secret sites for some special treatment and given given back to Egypt, to, uh, to, uh, to, to Libya. Uh, so these guys are now ruling Libya. So we have to monitor how, how they do it. Will they be inclusive or they will be exclusive? And what's happening today in Libya is, is, is very nice, uh, you know, not nice, very, very important situation to monitor. Same thing we we're talking about Yemen, you know. If we allowed Al-Qaeda to become fabric of the legitimate opposition in the south, then we're going to create a big problem with the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. And Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula won't be only Fahd al kuso and Jamal Badawi and other people. Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula then will be uh, all the southern people in Yemen who have legitimate concerns against the north. Uh, so we have to be very careful on all these things. It's not over. The threat is not over. 
And I think we have to keep monitoring it. The threat is changing, as I said. And now it is more into regional and local uh, issues that's making Al-Qaeda organize itself again and gain uh, territorial sanctuary among some people uh, again. How do you come down on the idea of that there should be some kind of um, commission that would investigate uh, coercive interrogations? You know, I, I, I was against it before. I said, you know what, people will know the truth. We declassified all these documentations. People can read. But to be honest with you, at this point, I think we need something like this. We need to tell uh, the American people once and for all, uh, is, was this effective on every level or wasn't it effective? I mean, when I talk about the efficacy, I don't only, I don't only talk about if that guy gave us a structure of Al-Qaeda that we already have. <laughs> you know, I'll talk about what value did we really get from these techniques? How did it affect our influence around the world? And how did it affect our strategy domestically and with our allies? Because I come from a school of thought that there should be a perfect synergy between your laws, your morality, and your strategy. And if that synergy doesn't exist, you ain't, going, you, you ain't getting anywhere. It's called hypocrisy, I think. Uh, exactly. Um. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Anthony Odi. I'm a consultant on economic development. Out of the reviews and other material that's been written about your book, is there anything that you would consider both fundamentally critical of the arguments you've made, especially on interrogation, and also well-informed and intellectually honest? In other words, have those who take a different position from you engaged with your arguments substantively? Uh, no. They never mentioned anything yet. Uh, the reviews has been good. It has been people who know about what they are talking about. See, there's a big difference between people who uh, look into facts and use facts to reach their conclusion and people who already have a predetermined conclusion and cherry pick facts to support their argu argument. And I think Peter, Peter, people like Peter, for example. Um, cherry picks all the time. <laughs> cherry picks all the time. <laughs> They, they will figure it out immediately when, when they see it. So well, let me ask you a little more um, on the, the courier, the uh, Ahmed al-Kuwaiti. Mm -hmm. Clearly, the information came from people who were coercively interrogated. Actually, from what uh, has been declassified, I don't yeah. know much about the information that led to bin Laden. I knew about the Kuwaiti before, but not the information that led to bin Laden. Uh, from what we know today, that after 183 sessions of waterboarding, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed downplayed uh, the role of Al-Kuwaiti, said he's basically, he's a nobody. Uh, so is Abu Farij al-Libi, and uh, one of Al-Qaeda commanders. And later on, years later, in 2005, they arrested, uh, no more than that, they arrested Hassan Ghul in Iraq. Hassan Ghul, and from what we understand from Senator Feinstein, what she said, before getting to any treatment, and Hassan Ghul, I don't believe he got to waterboarding. He wasn't waterboarded. He wasn't anything. He, uh, he was actually released and sent back to Pakistan. He's now free. Free. Um, he basically, immediately upon his arrest, they asked him, how do you get to, bin La uh, to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or to Abu Faraj or to Bin Laden if you want to pass a message? And he said, I go through that guy, Kuwaiti. So a smart CIA analyst back in Langley said, wait a second. Why KSM is lying about him and why Abu Faraj is lying about him? He must be important. Now, if you tell me that is a proof that enhanced interrogation techniques and waterboarding works, I have a great prize for you on a bridge in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, um, let me press you on that a little bit. Um, there was Katani, the 20th hijacker. Right. Um, he was subjected to Susan Crawford, who was a judge appointed by mm -hmm. Reagan, said the treatment. I know, I talked to Katani in Getma. Right, the treatment that he received was uh, tantamount to torture and he couldn't be prosecuted. Right. He also identified Ahmed Kuwaiti. Um, now the question is, you know, in, in what in a, in, a, in a totally different context. Right. He identified him as a person who was heading the guest house in Karachi. 
Right. He was at the guest house in Karachi. He also said that, that is you trained him um, before he came to the United States to be the 25th well, yeah, tracker. Yeah, and, I, and I, actually, I talked to Qatani about that. No, what did sorry. he say? This is, this is basically, I have to keep in mind that a lot of these things are still classified. Right. So I'm talking around stuff that I already heard people in the administration and people in the government talking about. But that's basically, that is, that is the idea of it. And, uh, and, and, and now we know actually know more than that. Now we know why he was the head of Karachi uh, guest house right. for Pakistan. Because he's, he's not a Kuwaiti. He's a Pakistani born in Kuwait. And who's a Pakistani born in Kuwait? Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. So Khalid Sheikh Mohammed being the narcissistic individual that he is, doesn't trust anyone. He's looking for a mini-me, somebody like him, somebody who basically have the same kind of background that he trusts. He's in his inner circle. And I won't be shocked if KSM knew him back in Kuwait. What was your impression of uh, the role of Kuwaiti before it became clear that he was the bin Laden's courier? You know, the, I, I, and again, I have to be very careful on how we yeah. I answer this, but I can tell you something that in Guantanamo, after Tora Bora, and when we start getting all the visitors to retire in, in, the, in the Caribbean island in Guantanamo, <laughs> and w we found out that uh, bin Laden starts surrounding himself with more Kuwaitis. And that was, uh, at the time, I thought it's maybe because Abu Ghaith, Salman mm. Abu Ghaith, and suddenly he became like high up spokesperson for Al-Qaeda. And then you have another individual who has been with him for a long time, Abu Yusuf Al-Kannas, who's also a Kuwaiti. So we start seeing some Kuwaiti influence. But to be honest with you, at the time, we never even thought in a million years that maybe because KSM also born in Kuwait, that didn't even get to our... Did the people uh, in Tor uh, <coughs> in, that you talk, spoke to uh, say that bin Laden was at the Battle of Tora Bora? He, uh, he was, and then he left. He left, and then I think soon after they start leaving and evacuating. But he left before them. And when were they telling you this information? In 02. Um, let me throw, throw it up to other questions in front here. Andrew Atkinson with uh, CSIS and the Transnational Threats Project. Um, we were talking about the Arab Spring and the issue of uh, if Islamists take power in Libya and Yemen especially. But what if uh, you know another dictator takes power? That could kind of lend credence to the near enemy argument. Do you see that as an issue and do you think that the U.S. needs to do something to intervene if that is the case? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm, I'm not against Islamists taking over. I'm just against radical Islamists taking over because radical Islamists have the tendency to take over when they are in power and then they're not going to give back power because they believe that it's ungodly to share power. Democracy is, 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 is not the right thing to do. Uh, it, it, and this is, this is what makes me scared because that will also create a problem uh, over there. But yeah, definitely, if you have a dictatorship uh, regime taking over, that's going to create Actually, we go, we go back to the 80s and the 70s. You know, what happened in Egypt with the assassination of uh, Sadat. And, uh, it will be, history will be repeating itself. So do you think the U.S. needs to take action? What, like yes, uh, I mean, look, so far, I mean, I, I like this term, the Arab Spring and everything. But if you think that there is, there is a legitimate concern that took place in the Middle East. In, e in, in, in uh, Egypt, for example, uh, people had enough of Mubarak and his sons and their cronies. But what happened is not a change of the regime. What happened is the military that was always in charge of Egypt, of the Egyptian institutions since the 50s, since Nasser, you know, told Mubarak so many times, put a VP, put a VP, put a VP. He didn't want to put a VP. So finally, when this thing starts happening, when there is a legitimate revolution by the Egyptian people, the military stood on the side, protected the people, but then when they knew that Mubarak is not going to stay, they had to take a decision. Either they will witness uh, 1979 Iran all over again or they will eject him out and the military takes over and that's what happened so the regime in Egypt is still the same regime didn't change yet Tunisia it's still the same regime didn't change up they ejected Ben Ali but all the main people of the regime and the institution still exist as it was before Ben Ali but Ben Ali and his cronies are out uh, what happened in Yemen is more interesting because what happened in Yemen today you, first of all you have an intelligence, uh, you have a political elite that's ruling the country. And 
this is basically an alliance between Ali Abdullah Saleh, who can have all the security and the army and the intelligence service and the security bureau and the central security. And he put all his uh, you know, children and nephews in, in these positions. And between uh, Al-Ahmar clan, uh, Hashid, all the tribes of Hashid, led now by Sadiq Al-Ahmar, the son of Hussein Al-Ahmar, who used to be the speaker of the parliament. When the revolution of Egypt and Tunisia, when that Arab Spring came to Yemen, it caused a fraction in, uh, in, in the government elite. So now they are against each other. However, the people in Tahrir Square of Sana'a, if you want to call it, <laughs> they do not have any alternative for Saleh. And the opposition of Saleh, Al-Ahmar and their associates, are not really liked nor trusted by the people. So the situation in Yemen is very different. And then think about it this way and then think about South Yemen that has a legitimate concerns against the North that goes back way before the Arab Spring. You know, there's issues about land confiscation. There's issues about uh, money for the families, for people who used to serve in the army um, during the south, uh, south of Yemen. There's issues about political representation. There, there are, are a lot of legitimate issues. So now Al-Qaeda is trying to take advantage of all these legitimate issues and saying, look, we're here to support you. I mean, I, I, I read an article the other day. One big tribal leader in uh, south of Yemen, Jeffrey, he was saying to, I think, one of the press media entities, forget which one, they were interviewing him. He said, well, we asked the government to promise to send us six teachers for our area, for the school, six teachers. Fahd al Kuso, one of the coal bombers, he came with 16 teachers. And then you blame us for supporting them and giving them, uh, giving them access to our land and access to our houses. I mean, these are the issues that Al-Qaeda is taking advantage of. So if we support Saleh in basically in his war against the South, because Saleh claims everybody in the South is Al-Qaeda. Well, not everyone is Al-Qaeda. Okay? If Al-Qaeda is a very, very small fraction of what's happening in, in Abyan and Zanzibar even. So if you look into this and you support him, then Al-Qaeda is going to be in the same position as they were in Iraq with the Sunni Triangle with the Sunnis, that they become, they become part of the fabric of the counterinsurgency against the government. So we have to be very careful about that. There is a thin line between targeting Al-Qaeda and between supporting Saleh. <laughs> and we have to don't cross that line. So the Arab Spring is a scary. Uh, I mean, a lot of people saying, I was in the Middle East uh, just a few weeks ago, and everybody is talking about the new birth of the Middle East, right? I said, well, let's see what, how the child is going to look like. <laughs> so it's all fine and dandy, but that child might have five heads, you know, affected by the Iranian nuclear. Uh, this lady here. <laughs> Hello, sir. Thank you for your uh, remarks. You've raised a lot of questions, but I'll try to limit to one. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Lorraine Barlett with the Office of Military Commissions. I'm on the defense side uh, representing a client. Uh, but my question doesn't have to do with that. Instead, I'd like you to please comment uh, concerning the Arab Spring. Harkening back for the last 10 years, uh, a little, I guess, represented uh, issue that doesn't get much press for obvious reasons is some of the motives that the Al-Qaeda have stated, particularly relating to Palestine. In your opinion, uh, how does the Arab Spring affect what's going on right now as far as the greater Arab world and the view about the, the emergence of a Palestinian state? And do you believe that if the United States were to essentially switch its position, would that assist us in resolving some of our ongoing conflicts in the Middle East? In other words, if, if we, instead of vetoing what's pending at the UN, if we, if we came around and decided to support the emergence of a Palestinian state, would that have the strategic impact of lessening our threat from Al-Qaeda? Thank you. Right. I honestly think that Al-Qaeda's threat today with everything that's happening in, in, in the Arab Spring is not that significant. 
that it has to impact our voting in the United Nations on the Palestinian states. I mean, there's a lot of other issues that we have to think about. And I think, for example, the problem that's happening today in Egypt between the Islamic Brotherhood and the Salafis and the liberal groups is way more important. And we need to focus on it way more than, uh, than the other stuff that we're focusing on with Al-Qaeda. Um, uh, now, as, as for what's happening today in the Arab Spring, we start realizing today that there is, um, uh, in Egypt, for example, and many other countries around, there is a huge support for the Palestinians. And the new government, or even the military government in Egypt, has to be extremely careful on how to deal with the Arab-Israeli issue. It's not like it was under Mubarak. Um, and we saw that recently, not only with what's happening in Sena, but also what's happening with uh, the borders in Rafah, what's happening. But I think at the same time, overall in the Arab countries, they are very nervous, even many Arab nations are very nervous about the creation of new Palestinian states because nobody knows how this Palestinian state is going to be. There is a whole issue of Hamas. There is a whole issue of Mahmoud Abbas. There is alliances that the, these, these entities, there is, the Palestinians don't even have one voice on this issue. Like even Hamas, for example, Hamas uh, is against a Palestinian state. And they think of Mahmoud Abbas as betraying uh, the Palestinian cause by announcing a pa Palestinian state for the 1970, uh, 1967 borders because they believe Palestine is all of Palestine, 1948 included. So there's a lot of issues that need to actually be solved and I think many of the Arab countries having a lot of concerns about, about these issues. And many Arab countries, they don't even want a Palestinian state. Like Syria, for example, I don't think that Syrians would love to have an issue, this is a card, Lebanon and the Palestinian issue is a card that they've been playing for the longest time and they don't want to lose that strategic card. But I think the point of the question is if we had a more even-handed um, kind of approach to the Palestinian-Israeli mm -hmm. uh, conflict, um, that that would take some of the anger out of the, the, the drives Al-Qaeda and like it, it might, it might from Al-Qaeda's perspective, but think about it this way. Um, what did Al-Qaeda do for the Palestinians? They didn't conduct one operation for the sake of Palestine. You know, if you want to talk about the Palestinian, I think maybe Hassan Nasrallah from Hezbollah, who is Shia, did more than Al Qaeda for the issue of Palestine. So Al Qaeda just uses that. And most of the people that we talk to about Al Qaeda, they have a lot of other reasons to hate the United States. I mean, if you wanted to make Al Qaeda happy, get rid of the Saudi monarchy. That will give them happy. Well, you know, we're not going to do that. So there's always an issue. Even if we give, if, if you wanted to satisfy a few hundred Qaeda members around the world and change our policy to satisfy these few hundred Qaeda members around the world, there's a lot of things we can change around the world and we need to change. You know, uh, the Saudis are part of them, the oil prices are another part. Uh, they truly believe even with the, you know, $100 bar barrel that we're stealing the oil, I mean, there's a lot of issues, and uh, again, logic and common sense doesn't exist. Now, if we were more even-handed, if, as, as Peter was saying, uh, in this issue, will we will be more will be more receptive in the region? Maybe, but I think foreign policy, especially in that region, is way more complicated than only the Arab-Israeli issue. Way more complicated than that. Okay, we have about five minutes, and uh, maybe, we'll, and uh, we're going to have ten minutes for. Uh, Mr. Tufan has very kindly agreed to sign some books. So, um, Jen, if we could uh, go in the back and just grab some questions there. Hi, how are you doing? I'm Adam Serwer from Mother Jones. Uh, I just want to know, why do you think the FBI has had such trouble recruiting more native Arab speakers uh, to the Bureau since 9-11? I really have no idea, Adam. <laughs> I mean, I, I wish I can tell you, <laughs> Good but uh, I, I, I have no idea. I, I, think, I think many Arab Americans today, when they hear the FBI, they think of them as subjects, not as agents. Um, and I think that's a big problem we have, to, uh, we have to deal with and we have to fix. That's unfortunate, but that's reality. Why did you leave the FBI? I think I had enough. Um, just... You know, I, I had enough of the bureaucracy, not necessarily of the bureau, but the overall government. I mean, I, I truly believe in one thing. I think you lead, you be led, or you get the heck out of the way. 
And since I couldn't do the first two, I get the heck out of the way. <laughs> Any other in back? Yeah. Hi, Christina Lamb from the Sunday Times. That was fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask you what you learn in your interrogations and in your uh, work about relations between Pakistan's ISI and Al Qaeda. From the interrogations, um, we didn't learn much about that with the people that I was interrogating. Um, you know, nothing, nothing significant. Uh, from that. However, um, I mean, it's not a secret that uh, the ISI um, thinks of non-state actors, or some elements at least in the ISI thinks of non-state actors and think of, uh, you know, some of them are terrorist groups like Lashkar al-Tayyiba, like uh, other elements, Haqqani Network, uh, as a proxy for Pakistani okay. interests in Central Asia. And I think we have to look at it from their perspective. Um, I think uh, countries don't have friendships, countries have national interest. And our national interest today in Pakistan and Afghanistan is very different than the ISIs and the pa some people in Pakistan's national interest. We are looking into Pakistan, we're looking into Afghanistan saying how the heck can we get out without guaranteeing that transnational terrorist group will use it again for attack, to launch attack against us and against the West. And they are looking at it. How can we guarantee India doesn't take over? And how we guarantee we establish a strategic depth to support Pakistan? And how do we do that? We do that with the Taliban. We do that with the Haqqani network. We do that with other elements that exist. I mean, the Haqqani network has been always the main proxy for the ISI in Pakistan. Even during the Northern Alliance times before uh, and, and, and the wars that was going on early on after the Mujahideen took over Kabul, and the Taliban, start, Pakistan supported the Taliban, and when the Taliban took Kabul, uh, Haqqani, Jalaluddin Haqqani actually, became a minister in the Taliban government for tribal affairs, I believe, if right. I'm not mistaken. Uh, because this is what the ISI in Pakistan wants him to do. You know, from the time against the Soviets, from our war against the Soviets in Afghanistan, the, you know, because we were involved in that war against the Soviet, and ISI always entrusted uh, Hikmatyar group and Hikmatyar Group, the main commander for Hikmatyar Group in Pakhtia in that region on the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan was Jalaluddin Haqqani. Um, so if you want the Pakistanis to give up Jalaluddin Haqqani, it's like asking us to give up uh, like a strong ally for us in the world. And that's, that's not going to happen for the Pakistani. Are you a Shia Muslim? I'm both. <laughs> By my mom and my dad. One parent is a Shia, one parent is Sunni. Ah. Is that useful when, when you're interrogating people? Yeah, you know, if you're a Hezbollah, I can interrogate you as Shia. That's <laughs> long <laughs> reason I can do it. Okay, this lady here with her hat in the middle. Thank you. Especially, you know, it's awesome to argue religion over scotch. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Sufan. And I want to tell you, I really admire you. I read The Looming Tower and uh, a number of books, and you're, you've been featured in them. And thank you for thank your you, service to our country. You don't thank know you. how much I admire you. I want to ask you a question. We always look for a U.S. Uh, response to trying to resolve the issues of radical ideology in the Middle East. Now, what are the Islamic countries or Arab countries doing about it themselves? You said there's this radical ideology that looks at the, this is the end of days. You, you can't negotiate with something like that. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with someone who's looking at something with a different cosmic reality. What are they doing? Um, the U.S., we have a lot of commitments around the world, maybe in over 179 countries. And what, what, can, what can they do to help their own situation? Uh, it destabilizes their own countries, right. uh, having that type of uh, Al-Qaeda and all these different groups running around. I, I think you hit on a very, very important point. I think Al-Qaeda, um, we have a lot of tactical wins against Al-Qaeda. But from a strategy perspective, we're still behind the eight ball in countering the ideology, countering the narrative. Uh, many countries around the world are doing a lot, but they are doing a lot in limiting the threat in their own boundaries. Like the Saudis, for example, they have that institute, Mohammed bin Naif Institute, where they do de-radicalization and they try to basically bring those people back to reality. Um, uh, I don't know how successful the program is, but they have their own numbers, their numbers is probably about 70% success. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Um, 
But you go to Indonesia, for example, there's an ad hoc program going on in dealing with these you know, radicals and how you counter it. In every Arab country they have, or Muslim country, they have a program. Um, even in countries that has uh, large Muslim communities. In India, for example, now they have a program where they train all the imams and you cannot be just an imam for a mosque without get, getting a certificate and all, you know, in advance. In, uh, in, in uh, Singapore, they have a phenomenal program of community relation, not necessarily religion, building stronger community relations. And you will see a lot of people in their police service and, you know, uh, and, and the intelligence service from the Muslim community and so forth. They have great relationship with ustads over there. Ustads is what we call imam. Uh, so every country has something. Um, unfortunately, I think we, we started to do something here in the United States. And I think uh, we started to focus recently in the last few years on this issue and trying to study what other countries are doing around the world. And I think uh, I believe that uh, you know, our State Department is involved in trying to you know, study these issues and phenomena. And even if we want to do something here in the United States with, to counter the homegrown terrorism, uh, we have to understand that what works in Minneapolis will be very different than what works in Queens. In Minneapolis, it's a Somali issue. You have to understand Somalia and the reasons people are joining the Shabab movement. Queens, you have to understand Afghanistan and Pakistan. Brooklyn, you have to understand the Palestinian issue. So what, what is the trigger for a person to join a terrorist organization? Um, always, always, even the global jihadi movement, always based on local reasons, not global reasons. Uh, nobody woke up one day and said, hey, I understand the global jihad of bin Laden of 1996. Even the 1996 jihad of Afghanistan, th this is the, considered the dissertation on global jihad that bin Laden wrote in August of 1996, or published in August of 1996. And by the way, he signed it Khorasan, Afghanistan, to, to make subliminal link to the black banners. Um, even that. Uh, it was based on what? It was based on our presence in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is what? His homeland. What he considers as his homeland. The title of it, Expel the Infidels from the Arabian Peninsula. So even the global jihad movement was based in its roots and uh, on, uh, on, uh, on local reasons. I want to thank Ali Sufan for a really brilliant presentation. And, uh... Thank you.